Hi, this is Jim Salfer again with the University of Minnesota Extension and welcome everyone to episode 14 of our 30 minute robot milking edition, kind of our second session here in 2022. Uh, again, as I mentioned, my name is Jim Salfer. I work for the University of Minnesota Extension. Kind of a new face, typically we'll have Marcia Endress do the introduction. She can't be with us today. She is my co-host. She's actually at the Midwest Dairy Challenge in Indiana. So for listeners who might not be familiar with the Dairy Challenge, it's where a team of students go out on farms and they split them up on farms and they do a total analysis of the farm. They get an access to records, also some financial records. And then they summarize those results and present them to a series of judges. So it's really an excellent contest, maybe been going on about 10 to 15 years in the US. So good luck to all the people that might be have children participating. And of course, good luck to the University of Minnesota team. Uh, again, our episodes are held every third Thursday of the month at 11.30 a.m., 11.30 to 12. If you're on for the first time and haven't been registered, please go to the link on the screen, z.umn.edu uh, slash 30minrm, and you can sign up and then you'll get automatic reminders each month. And of course, we'll also send out the recorded link to all of those. So if you want to do that, that would be wonderful. Uh, just again, a few questions. If you have questions for the producers after their presentation, make sure you type that question in the Q&A box. We really would prefer that because that's a box that we're monitoring. That will be at the bottom of your screen. So just hover over with the mouse. And then we will, in this situation, I'll read the questions on your behalf. So uh, please type in questions into your box. So as we move on today, I'd like to welcome our two presenters, our Steve and Bill, they're from Minnesota. And with that, I'll just turn it over to them and they can talk a little bit about their farm. And again, if you've got questions, type it in the Q&A box. So thanks, Steve and Bill, and uh, go ahead though. The floor is all yours. Well, I'm Bill, and this is Steve. So uh, just a brief summary or kind of some history here, what, what's going on. Um, this is our home farm. And you'll see next to this big three stall barn, there's uh, the old tie stall barn here. That was 44 stalls our parents had. And Steve and I, we were raised here uh, in this home, right? The rest of this wasn't here, but we both went through uh, college did various jobs out into the uh, egg business sector. And then we decided that we would come back and, you know, make it make a life here. And so we built a uh, 160 cow freestall sand barn, uh, manually scraped. And that's, yep, right in there. Um, and then from there, everything we just kind of expanded a little bit went across the road and put in feed bunkers into the clay hill um started with some calf facilities and branched out into heifers you know first we were raising having our heifers custom raised and buying all our feed was absolutely started with nothing um, and we were able to secure a loan for what 120 cows or something like that. So as we move forward, we fastened a flat parlor out of lever lock stanchions, and that was a back out flat parlor. We, in 2001, we went to the west end of the three stall barn, and that's the time we put uh, our lagoon in, and that's north of this dry cow barn over here the north and we put all mattresses in the barn and our little manure system with our pit back there is in there and we added scrapers to the barn so that was kind of a big change in, um, after that. so then in 2004 we put in a pit parlor that same number of cows i think we were up 200 cows by that time and we put it right where we were milking with the flat parlor. So that was challenging. So that's 
Let's see what else. Um, so we just kept adding more livestock or heifer replacement facilities and such a little bit all the time. This breeding barn down here south of our present nursery that that's that was built in 2010. Yep, right there. And I think the next year we moved back to the nursery here. That was just all you know, down here, right there. Yep. So this area with the short roof, that was the whole thing, and that just covered 25 calf hutches. Um, so we also retrofitted that and put calf feeding robots in there in what year was that? 18? Yeah. But then over here, we brought our springers back from any growers and we were completely raising our own heifers. That was in 2015. The next spring, we added on to our free stall barn put 100 stalls to the east, and we were running them all through our parlor. We also added onto our holding area, and we were running them through our double 10 herringbone parlor. So then, you know, we just became, labor shortage was just becoming more and more this whole time. Just, just a bigger deal, yeah not finding enough help to staff, staff the parlor basically amongst all the other chores. So we had kind of been looking at robots uh, for five years now at this point, 2000. And we finally did enough comparisons and going to look at what we thought we could make out of our system. And we settled in on uh, uh, four, Lavelle B 300s and we come up with a plan and that's the east end of our barn here. Yep, they're all in there. There's two robot rooms and then you know, beyond these trees we, that's attached to our utility rooms and office. So we should go to the next, see if we can get an overhead view of the floor plan, how the cows rotate. The guided flow. You have the next slide, Jim. Um, yeah. So this is kind of our barn. It's laid out center feed alley, tail to tail in the free stalls. Uh, this is actually before we put the robots in. So these, you know, these gates aren't here now. It's all open on one side. This here is uh, looking in on one of the commitment pens from the feed alley, yeah. And then the robots, each pen, there's one pen on either side of the feed alley, which each have a left and a right-handed robot. So the cows, um, let's go to the overhead and the floor plan, this one. So the cows, okay, and a guided flow, we have a milk first system, in which case these cows that are laying out in their water beds, chewing their cud, they can go to the feed alley through either smart gate, there's two on each side. And why we did two on each side is going back, remember we built that first part of the freestall barn in 1994. So our total barn width is only 90 feet. So we put this, we put a lot of the room in the stalls and we sacrificed in our alley. So our alleys are fairly narrow. We didn't want all the cows going down, going through one smart gate, to either get in to the commitment pen or back to the feed alley. So we used our present cross areas where they used to go back over to the parlor and we put a smart gate in there. So basically, when a cow does whatever she's gonna do, she wants to go eat, she's gonna go through one of these two gates, wherever it's closer for her. 
and she's going to be able to go eat unless it's time for her to get milk. And that's set up on parameters according to her lactation curve, phase and milk, stuff like that. So if she is eligible to get milked, this one's not going to, it's going to let her through and she'll have to do a U-turn, a 180. Or a lot of times now that they're smart cows, they just stick their head in there and watch the gate shift. So a lot of times if they know they can't go right through to the feed alley, they don't. They just wait and they wait their turn. They'll go down and they'll enter our commitment pen down here. So once that gate lets them in, they're committed to being milked. That's kind of why we call it a commitment pen. Um, and then you'll see they enter from the center here and they can either choose, I guess what's ever open. We don't have too many cows that are choosy, but there are some. But yeah, so if she goes to the south one there, if you can see that right here, they left it. So the left, a right-handed, one here, she's going to enter here in the middle, and then she's going to exit along the outside barn wall, and then she's going to go again through the smart gate, and it's going to let her out here into the feed alley. So the bump gate, the bump gate's right there. Yep. Yeah, there's a bump gate too before she comes into the smart gate as she's coming out of the free stalls. And that is just a gate on a pivot that she bumps it here to come into the smart gate entry, the commitment pen. And then when she comes back out, it, it, it pivots the other way. And then she'll go walking right through the, the smart gate to get the feed and go about her business. Now she's going to pass through. 300 feet of feed bunk here. She's going to walk by four waterers and two rotary back scratching brushes. Then she'll get on the west end of the barn here where it's labeled finger gate. And that is the slide before this, those blue gates, the PVC. If we go back to that slide. Right, right here. You know, this cow that you see here, all of them on the other side of that are still eating. So they're gonna walk right through there. It just kinda, you know, they'll pass through it and then they'll go around, pass another water and then the other side is all their water beds. So now let's go back to the overhead. So this cow here that enters the left-handed one in this south commitment pen, she just gets to come out and go through a one-way gate and she's out there. They don't seem to have a preference one way or the other, which, which milker they get milked in. But it's very simple for the cow. She, there's no guessing games trying to go ahead and get pellets. Um, you give them six pounds of pellets a day in the robot to give them something to eat as they're being milk, so they're content. But there's there's not a lot of drive um, to go and see if there's food there for them. It's very simple. They either can get milked, or they either can go to the feed bunk, or they go get milked first and then go to the feed bunk. So once she learns that, it all becomes pretty simple for her. So there's no, you know, we could have went to free a free flow with this. We'd had to open up a lot more barn here because our choices were limited to how much we could add onto our building. So this made the less impact and the most sense for us. And it's it's working. Um, yes, there's our numbers. Yeah, we have some more slides on some of the numbers, but. Let's go to that production. Or, well, there's our feed pusher. It's a feed refresher. So it's following a, 
Yeah, an induction line that's buried in the cement and sealed. And it'll, it'll, it's basically an auger running in reverse. So it pushes it out instead of sucking it in. And that refreshes it. So they smell that and it, it does work quite a bit. Also, it has a hopper on it that we can auger some robot pellets out whenever we want, but we, we do those middle of the night feeding or pushings, trying to encourage them colors to come up. And it's only putting out yeah. like 60 pounds a night. So yeah. It's just a few pellets to get them to want to come up and eat in the middle of the night. So, but that'll keep moving its way over to the curb till the next morning. And then we bring the feed in after we clean the majors. Yeah. So we're pretty happy with that. But yeah, here's some typical numbers we're seeing. Uh, so on that, that south group, south side of the barn, or we have our mature cows over there. On the north side, we have our younger cows. So yeah, we're brushing that 7,000 pounds of robot on the mature side and probably the 5,800 on the the heifer side. They're about equal cows on either side. So we're at, you know, we're getting that 63 probably. It varies. And we're averaging, what's today? 2.8, two pounds or milkings per day. We're usually between 98 and 102. On, on, there's about 250 cows out there right now, a little more right now. And our yearly average is a 4-1 fat and 3-2 protein. And here's the big thing. Our somatic cell count in the parlor was always around 100,000 or under. And we really wanted to keep that. Not only to keep putting out the highest quality possible milk, but at 75 cents to us. So we we're really sold on uh, this brand of milker because of the prep. And again, with the, and then the box times, we're, we're averaging six minutes and 25 seconds on box time. That's clearly a minute and a half, well over a minute quicker than the, other, than the other ones. But the guided flow here, another uh, advantage is six, I've seen some at three pounds pellets per cow per day. Um, that's another reason we're able to get cows in and out of there a little quicker. They're not eating massive pounds of, of grain in there. So, <laughs> yeah, that's really about it. We've made, we've adapted as the times have changed and this is just one more thing to provide a limit that basically squeeze more milk out of our facilities. They're still relevant if you choose them to be that way. But you gotta have a good plan with good cow flow and uh, it can work for you. So I guess that's the ball hit. Any questions, comments? That's kind of an overview, but Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Bill and Steve. So now we'll go to the question portion. If you want to type in some questions, uh, there's a couple here that I'll kind of get started on. I've got to get to my next slide. And it is, uh, what do you think is the influence of your food uh, feed pusher? Do you think you get more milkings? Do you get the more intake? Um, what, do you, what do you think are the advantages of putting that in? And you want to comment specifically on yours versus some of the other ones that just push up feed? I know we think I, when we got that one, we thought all of them kind of, you know, paid for themselves, what we understood. But this one kind of fluffs it a little better instead of smashing it into the, smashing it back to them. So it kind of keeps the consistency of the TMR or the PMR. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just, I mean, it keeps feet at the bunk all the time, right? Cause so, greatest sense is its nose. So if they smell, turn that feet up a little bit, that'll spark enough 
interest them come up and drive milk it takes yeah you want to avoid the you know the hurt of like a big group doing the same thing at once you want just a small number always doing you know moving keeping the flow just even throughout the barn i think that's kind of what that helps do Okay, there's another question on how many kind of fetch cows do you have in your guided flow system? And what, what do you consider a fetch cow? Or do you just want to talk about maybe training your heifers and how you, because they, they're sort of fetch cows. So if you want to comment, how many you have, what's your policy? Well, we're bringing a new heifer. Um, and during this cold weather, the past month and a half, we've been putting them in there a day or two fresh. Um, otherwise, we do have our special needs group, and we're still running them, them through a parlor right now. But uh, we'll put them out there at about 11 in the morning in the robot barn. We'll try to get them milking in within the next couple hours, and then try to get another milking in before we go home at 6 in the afternoon. We can get two in that first day, usually about two more days, they're on their own. Otherwise, you know, we want to get them cows through there every you know, six, seven hours for sure. And that kind of, they take off from there. Um, Fetch cows, usually 15 to 18 of them that are in what we call red cows that are just over whatever they're metrics are for you know lactation days and how much they're milking and how old they are and that number usually accumulates after bulk tank washes and the robots wash so that's there's a little bit of lull there otherwise throughout the evening and and the rest of the night there might be eight on a typical day but those fetch cows we're not going to get those fetch cows no. necessarily we're just no. when we no. go through to clean beds couple times a day we get those up while we're doing that we get those cows up and maybe even um, get them out of their stall usually not and then they'll usually find their way to the robot on their own there's very few cows that we actually go get and bring to the robot then i don't think i maybe it, once a week there would I'll be something one. wrong with them yeah like you know um so september we'll get some Hoof issues, maybe we had some warm days. If, if it's a hoof issue, or we've had a little bit of respiratory in the last few weeks, um, but we're we can see all that on the animal health stuff. So a lot of times those will be a fetch call. But the day to day on the healthy animals, really, I mean, there's maybe a handful. Besides the new, that you have to get up. Besides the new heifers. Yeah, really, the only ones we have to fetch are the brand new heifers to train. They haven't been in here before. We are thinking a, about maybe putting another robot and replacing our parlor group all together. But there's kind of a follow-up question to that, and I think you may have answered that already. But how long does it typically take to train a new heifer in your facility before you you're pretty comfortable they're going up through on their own? Three days. Okay, so three days. Three days, and you probably um, we have a little couple of portable gates that we can kind of guide her into the robots um, in the commitment pens. What do you think we have to guide them? Five, six times, and then they're good. Some of them will catch on. And that would be your average. two, three days. So some are less okay, than good. some are more. And then I guess it is a question here. How do you manage your treated and fresh cows? We pull them out of this robot barn and we have them over in our special needs group. And that's, we're running those through our milking parlor right now. So we have about 40 cows over there and start to finish, that's about an hour of work. Okay. Uh, the other question we always get is what do you do for foot baths? So go back there by those finger gates, there's a water. And we have a, a gate mounted to the fence back there that we can swing to force them to go through a portable foot bath. Yeah. Can I go back there? Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Like 
Yeah, yeah, if you go to the overhead, the, the yeah. Yep, yeah, right where that cow is. Yeah. We'll bring a gate off this back wall. We'll force them between the water. And, and they have to go yeah. through there. And we're not, you know, once a week it's tops. Tops. We don't really run it that often as much as we, we should or other people do probably. So that being said, brings up another topic. We do not move all our cows to bed. We never move all our cows to a group. We're bedding around the cows in their natural state. So they get bedding thrown in. Right now it's by hand. This coming summer, we are putting in a bedding, a robot that's going to go above the stall. But we're bedding from that alley right now manually, and we don't move the cows. So they're not forced through that foot bath. They're not forced at any time. Everything's free will. And but they do have to go through that foot bath to lay down yeah. after they knock. So we know they're going through there. Yeah. But I don't know. We, we think there's a lot to their animal behavior, which, which might drive a little bit extra milk in not moving the cows. Letting them have their order on how they see fit. We think maybe that's why we're having a little bit better acceptance. If you will. Do you want to comment on, we have another question on components. Do you want to comment about your components after you moved into robots or typically generally what they, I think you had it on that slide, what it they are. Change. It stayed the same. Component. Okay. No, and that was twice a day milking. We were at between 82 and 85 pounds year round. So it didn't change. They just eat more. What did your milk production do when you switched to robots? Well, they're up. I think we were just talking about it, probably 12 pounds. Okay. And another question, how do you manage treated and fresh cows? You talked a little bit about that. Are they, are they in your parlor or how old are, or how, how fresh are they when you move them into your barn? Or say you get a cow with mastitis or something like that. What do you do with those cows? Well, the mastitis cow we'll, we'll take out of here and then we'll treat her. She goes in our parlor group, same way with the fresh cows. Um, you know, just so we, the cows, as soon as their dry cow therapy is out of them, you can do it either way. They're back in the robot barn right away. And they, if they're, you know, if they're, if they've been in the barn before with the robots, that's, they don't miss a beat. I mean, they'll figure that out. We don't even bother chasing those in. Um, the heifers, we melt those, like you said, a couple of days and then they're in the robots. I guess it was more of a, a safety insurance to get those cows out of the barn and know for sure that if you did treat that quarter and something magically happened where it didn't get entered, we just want to be sure that, and it takes time. It would the robot yeah. would wash after a treated cow, which um, takes six minutes, and that's just time. To, we want cow these to get robots harvesting milk. We don't want. Hey, okay. how about hoof trimming? Uh, how important is it? Where do you do it? How often do you do it? We're on a like a six every six week schedule. We do 30, 40 cows each time. We do it in our old parlor and uh, hold the holding area of the old parlor there. It's it's probably not any more important, but it's more prevalent because when you were bringing our groups in to milk them through the parlor, if she had a little bit of lamp, she would still get milked. Well, if she's got a you know some sort of sore foot, either an abscess or something going on. She's not going to go get milked unless it's better. So you you notice right away. You so gotta, we really we're trying mobile. to get better with our with our trimming, and we are because we have the time now. So okay, well our half hour is up, so we have a few more questions. So if Bill and Steve are willing to stay on, um, we can answer those questions afterwards. But with that, I'd like to just thank everybody for joining us. 
Um, remember, again, to register. That was on the early slide. If you want to get reminders, and a special thanks to Bill and Steve. It's always uh, good to find really good farmers that are willing to share what they're doing. And I would just remind everybody, see you for episode 15 on March 17th. So thanks, everyone.